One, I work in a business hotel chain in the middle of Tokyo. And let me just say, the amount of uninformed inbound tourists is just ridiculous. For those who don't know, a business hotel in Japan is usually a hotel used by Japanese salarymen. These are usually tiny ass rooms, no frills whatsoever. Just equipped with everything you could ever need for a short stay in a tiny box. Now our hotel is on the more premium side of a Japanese business hotel. It's relatively spacious, we have a decent gym, a restaurant open for buffets, for breakfast and lunch, good amenities, free laundry room and so on. You get the idea. But these freaking tourists just book without understanding that we are not a high-end hotel chain and complain about how tiny the rooms are, why a room is called double room when there's only one double-sized bed, why there's no daily housekeeping services when they clearly booked an eco-plan without cleaning services, blah blah blah. Even though the room size and every little detail is literally on the reservation page and our website. Don't even get me started on those who waltz in the front desk at 9am expecting a free check-in right away, when their reservation clearly states check-in at 3pm. And when you tell them they need to pay an early check-in fee, it's like the whole world is collapsing and we are sabotaging their Japan trip. And no, even if you yell at the front desk quoting, Customer is always right. I can't just pull a clean room out of my ass indeed. Customer is king, but only when they're in the right. How am I supposed to check your highness in now in the morning when we are fully booked the night before? Low on staff. And some other sultan is bitching on the side for a free late checkout at 2pm because apparently all hotels in the countries he visited before gave him late checkouts. Like, come on. Is doing a little research on the country you're visiting too much of a hassle? Is it that hard to check your reservation before bitching at an overworked front desk girly? I am at my wit's end writing this after pacifying another crown prince and princess from the land of hawks and tralala, complaining about why their reservation is a smoking room when it clearly says so on their reservation. Sayonara, folks, and wish me luck for the rest of this nightmare. Two. So this guest comes in, and she is a regular at this point. The first time she stayed with us, it was with her company, and she ended up racking a huge bill of incidentals because she was letting her kids get whatever snacks they wanted all day. About $150 plus in two days. And her card was declining, and management told me that I was not to let her charge anything else to the room unless she updated the method of payment. She came down about 10 minutes before my shift was over and tried to charge more things to the room. I let her know what management said, and that she would need to update the card. She said the card wasn't hers, it was a company card, and she would need to go upstairs and fix it on her laptop. And I never saw her again since my shift was over. A few days after that, she had a reservation my manager cancelled since her payment kept declining. Fast forward a few weeks, she's a guest again, and it was well past 3pm, and she wasn't checked out but had a new reservation. My manager asked me to check her out, and back in, and the card on file for the new reservation was declining yet again. I called to let her know she would need to come to the desk to update the payment, she comes down and says it shouldn't be declining and had me run the card multiple times and it kept declining. And I said she needed to put a new card on file. She went back to the room and my manager was pissed and had me call her yet again and tell her to come down and basically said that her company card wasn't working and she doesn't have it so she would come back later to check back in. She came back at around 10pm and was wanting me to use the card on file to check her in. My manager explicitly told me that if she tried to check in without a card present, she would need a CCA. I sent her one, and she filled it out for her boss, and then I didn't see her because she checked in after my shift and night audit. She checked in the day before yesterday at 3am, and night audit checked her in last night, she came up to the desk and started accusing me of stereotyping her and that I thought her card was fraud from the previous day, 
and that her card was never declining and I just didn't want her staying at the hotel. She was being hostile and not willing to listen to my explanation, so I got my manager and he spoke with her. He had tried to explain a credit card authorization to her as well, but she basically lied and said that I never told her anything about her declined cards and that I was also lying when I told her that her cards declined and it's illegal for me not to allow her to stay there. My manager basically kissed her ass and told her those weren't my intentions. Now I get to go back this morning and check her out today. Yay me. 3. Is this what hell looks like? That was my thought for the whole night of work at the front desk in a four-star beautiful Parisian hotel. I was on night shift, 7.30pm to 7.30am, briefly after Covid started to dissipate and European borders were starting to open. It was a calm night, 10 to 15% occupancy. I was the only person during night shift. No bars or restaurants have reopened yet. This guy checks in late all alone and asks me until what time the bar is open. My mistake was to tell him that it was only me during the shift, so as long as I was there he could buy some drinks. He made me regret every single minute. T minus zero, he goes up into his room. T plus 15 minutes, comes down, says he needed his invoice, and because he's already downstairs, he might as well buy a beer. Up the lift he goes with his beer and invoice. T plus 30 minutes, goes out to have a smoke. Oh well, I'm already down here, I might as well have a beer. Up the lift again. T plus 45 minutes, comes down, checks out the garden. Oh well, I might have a beer, since I'm here. Up the lift. T plus one hour. Or got my key. While you're at it, uh, get me a beer, please. Up the lift. At the tenth beer, I stopped counting them. Every time he goes up the lift, he doesn't try any small talk. He always had an excuse instead of just asking plainly for a beer. I offer to buy the carton and have it in his mini bar at the room, which he refused. I offered him to stay downstairs and get himself comfortable in our beautiful lobby. He also refused. I tried giving him an alcohol-free beer to see if he noticed. He didn't. He wouldn't get drunk either. At one point, he was getting drunk but goes out to pick up a delivery. Comes in with no food or nothing. At 3 a.m., I recognize how dealers operate in Paris. He goes up with what felt like the 100th beer. Comes down 15 minutes later, all fresh for the next beer. Cocaine for sure. I'm stuck with this one. At one point, I just thought I must have stepped into a black hole and got stuck into a time loop. Or maybe this is what hell looks like. Oh god, I know what it is. I'm in Jean-Paul Sartre's play, No Exit. This is actually what hell looks like. Hell is other people. Now I get it. Eventually, people started coming down for breakfast, and he came down no more. Relief. Altogether, he must have had 40 beers or so. Up to this day, I can't believe it was a real-life experience. Four. I am working night audit and waiting for check-ins when I get a phone call from someone claiming to be the hotel owner. I think, that's a little weird, but sure, whatever. I just want to get back to reading my book. He asks if any manager is in, and I say no. They won't be in till morning. Also a red flag, but I dismiss it. Maybe this guy's just an idiot. He says he has a message he wants me to pass on to the manager. Something about fire inspections from the city. How they'll be checking licenses and permits that are coming in the mail. I'm thinking at this point this sounds like elaborate busy work, so it's probably legit, right? It's not, and thinking about it after the fact, it's so 
obviously BS. Apparently, these permits are coming in via FedEx, and I need to write down a tracking number, and then he hits me with, Oh yeah, I got your GM on the phone right now. He says sorry for not giving you the heads up, and that he owes you big time for this. This is when the warning bells go off again. My GM has no issues messaging me about stuff going on at work to keep our front desk staff in the loop about stuff. So if this was a legit call, I'd expect at least an incoming text from him, so I know it wasn't a scam. So now I'm kinda on edge about this guy, but I'm still kind of going along with it. Like, I know in my gut that something is wrong, but I'm so hardwired to go along with authority figures that I keep following, even though I can barely hear what they're saying at times, and their whole pitch doesn't make a lot of sense. He says to me that FedEx is trying to call us, but the line is busy so he needs to call me on my personal cell to instruct me on the phone. I tell him I'm not comfortable giving him my number, and he just says he is the owner of the hotel and is talking to my GM. And in a moment of weakness I'm still currently kicking myself for, I cave and give him my number. So, then I answer his call in my cell and answer FedEx on the front desk phone and listen to this very bizarre back and forth about a payment declining and how the owner is on his way to pay in cash. Does FedEx accept cash? Oh, this is fake, isn't it? No, they don't accept cash, but we can pay for an extension on our deadline. Use your phone to look up a Bitcoin ATM right now. Oh, this is definitely fake. And at this point, I feel confident enough in just hanging up both phones. I immediately get a call back from the guy in my cell, but I ignore it to phone my GM. It goes straight to voicemail. Presumably because he's asleep and kept his phone off. So then I call my other manager and relay what just happened, just to confirm this was in fact a scammer. I was kind of jumpy because I had just given out my phone number and the info that I was alone at the front desk, but she let me know everything was good and that we get these scam calls almost once a month and they've never shown up or tried anything. One. I took a job as a front desk worker at a 120 room hotel in my hometown from August of 2021 to March of 2022. And it was something. First, during my stint, we had two guests die while staying with us. Now, I am not sure how common this is overall, but the frequency makes me suspect the average Joe doesn't know they have a high chance of sleeping somewhere someone died when they stay at a hotel. In fairness, one of the deaths did not technically happen on property, as a man was found unconscious and got whisked away by paramedics. In the other case, the person died in his bed, and it wasn't until the second day he was removed, because the first day housekeeping saw him asleep and assumed he was staying another day. Then we get to the hotel operations, which was, well, in my opinion, an absolute shit show. Now, this was happening while people were still getting their bearings with COVID, which I think may have contributed to the chaos. Also, my town was dealing with a service labor shortage due to the high cost of living and limited housing. Housekeeping was chronically understaffed, and it was basically 50-50 for days when we would have rooms cleaned by the time guests arrived. We also had a chronic shortage of everything guests asked extra of, towels, washcloths, coffee, etc. The most stressful problem, however, was the room bookings. Now, I have done a decent amount of traveling in my relatively young life, with my family and on my own. I have never encountered a situation where a hotel was overbooked when I showed up. This was also a constant problem at the hotel. The system would be set to deliberately overbook rooms on the theory that people would cancel. Most of the time, however, this did not happen. The hotel was linked with two other properties which shared management staff on either side, 
which we had to constantly transfer people to. On some occasions, even this wasn't enough, and we would have to literally call around town to try to find people a room. Most people took it in stride, but obviously there were some who were pissed off. One night, I actually had someone who went to another hotel and came back and literally called the police at 11 p.m. because she wanted to stay at our hotel. The most stressful period was late December to mid-January. Right at Christmas, we had a COVID outbreak hit the housekeeping staff, which crippled our ability to turn over rooms and keep fresh linens in supply. My co-worker lamented to me how there was no Christmas spirit to be found. The second blow came the first week of January. At that point, we were only three full-time front desk personnel in a shift system. Our supervisor in the morning, my co-worker doing the 11 to 7, and then me in the evening. All of us were working six days a week with my manager covering for shifts too, so, so we could each have one day off. Then my two co-workers got COVID, and for about a week, I was running the front desk of a 120-room hotel all by myself for most of my shift. I joked I was the COVID Highlander in that I never ended up getting sick unlike literally everyone else at my job at one point or another. The management had an outbreak back in October too. Finally, were the weird gimmicky things the hotel did to try in vain to boost the reviews due to complaints about all the aforementioned problems, plus a host of others related to the property. First, they put in a popcorn machine in the lobby, which we, as front desk workers, were responsible for both serving guests and cleaning it every night. About a week before I left, they put in a slushy machine too. At least that was self-serve. I joked to my manager about how we were becoming a 7-Eleven. If there was any consolation, I never had any bad interaction with my managers, despite occasionally, due to stress, slipping into behavior that was, well, less than what could be considered exemplary for a customer service position. I do think, though, part of it was that they were so desperate for people, they were willing to overlook my occasional lapses in SOP. All in all, in a way, I am proud I was able to handle all of that, and how when I left, pretty much everyone there thought I was a good worker. I would never want to do it again, though. Hey everybody, Hal Freezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Kuahu. Episode 140. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Before you go, hit that like button. And if you'd like early access to these videos, you can get that by joining my Patreon page, which is linked in the description. You'll also find a link to the Hell Freezer merchandise store on Teespring. And if you want to leave a tip, then you can do that by clicking on the heart with a dollar sign underneath the video. Not required, but it is appreciated and it helps me out. Right. Don't believe we've any other business today, so let's move right along to Hellfreezer's question of the day. And today's question is... And this one comes from my moderator, Shigar. Is jerky a snack or an addition to a meal? Well, I can't imagine jerky being an addition to a meal. I've only ever considered it a snack in between meals. And I like it. It's very yummy. I've had different varieties. I even had a vegan jerky once which was actually surprisingly good. Very well seasoned, it was quite tasty. But yes, I think for my cases, jerky is definitely much. Definitely just a snack. Although perhaps those of you out there have, have some jerky recipes, things you can do with it. Maybe you're, you're a fan of jerky and mashed potatoes or something. If you are, enlighten me. I'd like to know. And of course, leave your answers in a comment below. And before we go, let's have the answer of the day from a previous video. And I think this question was in relation to, do you have anything you need to check and recheck all the time? Uh, like me with the, the door handle to make sure it's locked. And today's answer comes from nobody. Duh, my car alarm. I set it, walk away. Did it beep and flash the lights to confirm it's on? Turn around, click the key fob, watching intently for the lights to flash, listen for the beep. Okay, saw it and heard it. Still don't trust it. 
I don't unlock my car from a distance. I wait until I can see the car windows and check that the lock is engaged. I don't trust my car alarm. It's never told me that my car has been broken into, so it's right that I not trust it. My sister's new car texts her and calls her if the alarm is triggered. It takes a photo of a person or another car or object that's near it. It sends her pictures of cars that got too close and cars that dinged hers. Her BMW even tells her where she parked and will honk and flash lights to help her find it in a parking lot or on the street. Her car thinks for her, my car expects me to figure shit out on my own. Thank you very much for your answer, nobody. And with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.